Welcome to another episode of 30 Minutes with DailyStraits.com. Today, our guest is the founder of Wets on Call. Wets on Call is a tech disruptor to the 4 billion Australian veterinarian industry, a full service veterinarian provider using a custom built mobile app to deliver vet services into people's home that was founded by 31 year old indigenous entrepreneur Morgan Coleman. After, less than a, after a less than pleasing visit to the vet with his beloved dog, Milky, Morgan realized the opportunity to create better healthcare outcomes for his pets, for pets by delivering vet services in a more convenient and less stressful environment. He then sold his house and car and used the proceed to fund the beginning of the business. Partnering with an uh, accomplished vet, Magna West and tech partners, Nathan Sinat, and Ryle Copper Holes. To date, Wets on Call has amassed 5,500 clients in Melbourne and it's uh, on its way to expand to Brisbane and the rest of Australia. So, without further ado, let's welcome Mac Morgan to the show. Hi, Morgan, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. No worries. So, let's dive right into it. So, how is Milky these days? Milky's great. So, Milky hasn't um, set foot in a vet clinic for about three years now. And she's had multiple issues, skin issues, eye issues, ear issues, and uh, it's all been treated in home thanks to Vets on Call. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks to the dog. So um, you have now a thriving business. So um, were you, uh, just out of curiosity, were you a, a worker? I mean, uh, were you working before you, when you started this business or were you always yes. a serial entrepreneur? No, so I actually started my career in property development and construction management. So I graduated from um, Bachelor of Commerce at Melbourne University and then went into um, a corporate corporate job working across multiple different projects in Melbourne and Sydney um, and mainly construction management and property development roles. All right. So you, um, you, eased, you did you shut that down to start this or... I did have to quit that job, yeah. So I think um, for me, when I was I was working for them, it was a really large company. I think at the time they had about thirteen thousand employees globally, um, and I didn't feel I had three really great years with them. And then in the fourth year, I just felt like I wasn't in charge of of where I was going in terms of my career um, and my life, and that really didn't sit well. Um, I felt really disempowered and I just remember sitting there one day at the office and thinking like, yeah, I, I'm not meant to be here. I'm bigger than this and um, this isn't making me happy. But in that same moment, I realized that, you know, I needed to go and do something myself um, if I was to take, take charge of that and, and empower myself. And that's when I decided that I was going to start my own business. And at the time, I didn't actually know what that was going to be. And then... <laughs> Just coincidentally, I took Milky to the vet shortly after, and I thought, "This is it. This opportunity is is massive." Awesome. Uh, so that was in twenty seventeen, right, or twenty sixteen? Correct. Yeah, twenty seventeen. So twenty seventeen, then uh, Milky got sick. You took you took uh, the dog. Is he or her? Sorry. <laughs> she. She. So took her to the clinic, and then you got this um, uh, high idea for a business. So what was your next step in validating the idea? Well, so when I walked into the clinic that day, I realized that there was an opportunity to disrupt that business model. It's a really stagnant, very traditional business model in terms of how vet clinics operate. I found it very difficult to get there during business hours. So I needed something that was going to be more convenient um, and less stressful on the pet to get better healthcare outcomes. So the moment I actually walked out of that clinic, I got into my car and I had a scrap piece of paper in the front seat and I drew out the blueprint of Bets on Call in terms of the business model. So how we would actually make money and um, fulfill the client needs, but then also the customer experience journey. So that was my first step. But then after that, like you, it's a good idea, right? But you need to make sure that the market actually wants that. So the next thing that I did was um, I actually went and I set up a, a survey for pet owners and for vets as well. So I was then testing what the kind of appetite would be for both sides of the marketplace. Um, and I pushed that out through all my social networks that, you know, just if you had a dog or a cat, I really would appreciate you taking two minutes to fill this in. And if you're a vet, similarly, 
And through that, I was able to gain enough quantitative data to, to start making some assumptions about, or some generalizations um, about what the market would like um, and what the market would use. And from then, I really started to build out um, what I would call like, I broke down the Vets on Call service into the most basic version of it. And that was using technology to have a vet connected with a client with the services delivered in home. So initially I was the middleman. I actually acted as the app and our website does now um, where I would have clients um, email in, say I need a vet for these reasons. Um, this is the kind of days that I'm looking for and this is where I'm located. And I would match that with the vets that were in those areas with their availabilities. Um, to do that though was a bit of a challenge because you know, you don't have, I wasn't actually charging the clients at this stage. I went to um, I went to dog parks and I would hang out in dog parks and I would convince um, random strangers basically to help me trial out this, this business. And the feedback that I was getting was really positive. And then with each, each booking, I would call the client and I would call the vet and I would say, you know, what worked, what didn't, what do you need? What don't you need? Those sorts of things. So as I was building it out in a really rudimentary way, I was building out the blueprint for the technology that we were going to build. So, you know, the kinds of medications that we were going to need, like how best, how it would be easiest for the vet to be able to add that and work up a case, the kind of um, notes that we would need to be able, the vet would need to be able to um, take and, and, and record and those sorts of things. And, and similarly from the client's point of view, like how the booking process would work best for them and um, what kind of information they need and, and those sorts of things. So by the time that I'd done that, probably probably 20, 30 times, I had a really clear view of, okay, these are the features we need from in the app from the vet side. And these are the features we need from the client side. Now let's go and build it. All right. So you quit your job by then when you were starting this. Uh, all right. I did, and yeah. You also sold your house and your, you, and your car, right? Yep. Yeah. So once I decided that I think this was a really good opportunity to pursue, um, you know, I think the thing about B2C uh, businesses is that they're pretty, they can be very resource heavy um, and capital intensive. So I knew that I was going to need some capital and the only things that I had to my name was um, an apartment and a car. So I sold them both and I used that for like the seed capital to get us going. So who, um, did you speak to anyone before you embark on selling and all thing, or it was just, it's my decision. I want to build this business uh, because it's a big decision to sell a house. It's not easy to buy one. No, it's not. Um, no, I didn't speak to like anybody because I think the the thing is, once you what we're doing at Vets Co is is really different to what's been done for the last sort of 50, 60 years in the industry. And I didn't have the network of entrepreneurs or business people within my personal network. And so like the people that I would be talking to would be like my family and friends that are working corporate jobs or other sorts of jobs. And that would seem absolutely crazy to them. But the more that I looked at the data, the more that I looked at um, the opportunity that I saw within this, in this, within this space, the more I just thought this is, this is going to be massive and I need to get going as fast as I can. Um, I did look at other sorts of uh, resources, so the capital resources, but there's actually very few for basically an idea. Um, and from an investment point of view, if you go to a VC and you say, I've got this idea, the first thing they're going to say is, so what, what proof of concept do you have? And at the time, you know, aside from that rudimentary um, system that I'd set up with emails, I didn't have any and I needed to go and do that. And the only way to do that was to self-fund it for, for a period of time to go and get that kind of clear data to it that would make us an attractive investment to a venture capitalist. Awesome. So did, were you married then? Did you need to check things with your partner or it was just you alone? I was with my wife, but we weren't married at that stage. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I think maybe, maybe if we had been married, it would have been a bit more difficult and a few more conversations. But um, 
No, look, my wife has always been really supportive, even, you know, before we were married and stuff. And I actually remember coming home to her the day that I decided that I, I didn't want to work at this company anymore. Um, and I just said, I'm really unhappy. I, I want to do my own thing. And she was just like, so when do you quit? And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so she was, she's always been incredibly supportive. And I, I think like, you know, being an an entrepreneur and and starting something that is so different and disruptive um it can be really hard and you need those people around like my wife is kind of like my biggest cheerleader in that you know on the days that I'm having a rough one she's the one that sort of says like don't forget like who you are and what you've done and you know what you've accomplished it's amazing and this is just a setback it's not the end kind of thing she's always the one that picks me up so yeah, I think she still would have let me sell the house anyway. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So I would, wanted to ask you, how much did you start with? So you got 60000 from the house. What about the car? What was the combination of? Oh, look, the car wasn't very much. Um, that was my first ever car. I think I sold it for about $5,000. So it wasn't a lot of money. Um, and it went a lot quicker than I thought it would. But um, I certainly don't regret using that capital to, to start my business. Awesome. So, okay, you got $65,000. You validated the idea. What next? So then I went and sought a tech a tech partner. So that's where I went and met um, with Nathan and Rail. And I spoke to them about, this is what I want to build. This is how it is. And I did have to give them the pitch of, you know, this is the opportunity as well, because um, I didn't have enough money to pay for the build of the app. Um, I really needed somebody that was going to come on as a tech partner because, you know, what we've got in terms of our tech, um, it would be probably, if I went to the market, we'd be looking at like $1.5 million, like as a, as a minimum sort of starting day, um, starting point. So I didn't have that money. I didn't have the venture capital backing. So I really needed a partner. Um, and I was really fortunate in how I met Nathan and Rail. Um, it was through an introduction to a mutual acquaintance and it was just very serendipitous. Um, and that, that re- those relationships have been really positive, not just for myself personally, obviously, but for the business as well. Um, but I also then realized, you know, I can't be running a veterinary business if I don't have a vet. And that's where I went and sought partnership with Magda. So that was just once again, through conversations of, with friends and stuff like that. Magda is a very business um, thinking vet, which um not a lot of vets do think that so commercially, whereas Magda can get, you know, she straddles really well between what we need to do as a vet um, service provider, but also, you know, what we need to do from a business and commercial point of view. And so we've managed to get a really, really good team together to, to get us to where we are now. Awesome. So all these people were strangers to you, right? Before you met them. And okay. Yeah. And so the uh, Nathan and Rail brought the tech uh, capabilities your idea and Magna gave you the context, right? For them to come on board. So yep. um, right now, how many um, vets do you have on your, got on your app? 70 vets um, mm-hmm. on our platform in Melbourne. And of those, a, a handful of them are actually um, our staff as well. So they work within the business um, in other areas of the business as well. So some of the education, some of our logistics, you know, product development, those sorts of things. But the vast majority are actually like on a contractor sort of role. So if, um, tell us how the app works. Okay, I have a dog and the dog is not well. So I go on the app and I have to explain what symptoms the dog has or? So basically, if you've ever booked like your, um, your doctor's appointment online or something like that, that's how you're doing it. You're selecting the date, the time, um, the pet that you need it for. And then you do give us a brief description as to, you know, um, red rash on on the stomach or something like that. It just needs to be a brief description so we know, like, you know, as we're heading out, okay, this is what I'm about to walk into. Um, the other thing for that is that it can also flag some bigger problems. So sometimes like, pet owners don't quite know how serious their the condition is, um, and it might be something that we need to reschedule so that we can get there faster, or you know, um, that may need further imaging. So we're sort of preparing the client that, yep, we might actually need to do some x-rays after this consult, those sorts of things. But 
after that, you select your vet because what will happen is you'll see the, the date and the time. You'll see the vets that are available at that time that are operating in your area. You select the vet um, and then you just confirm the booking and the vet will arrive on time. Hopefully. Awesome. Is, there, is there any way to put pictures on the app, a chat probably? Yep. Yep. So you can personalize it. You can put a picture up for yourself. Um, a bit of an icebreaker, which we do encourage our users to do. Um, you can put your pet's profile, um, a profile picture up because every single one of our pets that we see, they have their own profile and we maintain all their health records within that profile as well. So it's basically like the clinic in the palm of your hand is the way that we describe it in that if you go to a local clinic, you're expecting them to maintain all your pet's health history um, and have a bit of a profile for each of those pets. It's the exact same. The only difference with Vets on Call is that obviously we deliver our services in home, but we add the transparency of you can see all your pet's health history. So if you want to go back and have a look through the notes of um, Milky's appointment two months ago or three months ago, you can do that. You can see everything that the vet wrote, the plan that they had in terms of um, the treatment plan, the medications they prescribed, you can see all of that. Um, and that's very different to what you would get at a traditional clinic. Um, and it just makes it more accessible. It means that if you move, if you go into state, if you're on holiday, all the pets histories are in your app and you can use them with another vets on call vet um, mm -hmm. just regardless of where you are located all righty how much is a house call it's like um if a so pet it's 88 dollars 88 dollars so um is there cancellation like if the if the owner changes the mind do you have a cancellation fee we do and it's pretty typical of like most clinics so if you plan to cancel within six hours of your booking it's a 50 percent um, cancellation fee and if you cancel within two hours it's 100 percent. and the reason that we do that is because within two hours we're anticipating that the vet is basically on their way or getting ready to go um, and it's also impossible for us to fill that slot as well so that's basically the way that we have in terms of our cancellation period but in terms of before six hours so if you booked for next week and you didn't think that you know, next week rolls around and you don't think that it's that necessary anymore you can cancel without any fees awesome so can you tell us like how do you monetize if you want if it's if you can share yeah of course uh so in terms of the way that bets on call makes money we make money um from the consultation so we take a clip on the ticket from the vet um, in terms of what how much they've charged out to the client we take a, a clip on the total fee of what they do in the home but we also have other revenue streams so if the vet, if the pet needs something that the vet doesn't have on hand, um, they'll prescribe that through the app and we send that out through our warehouse and we make money on it that way as well. We also have in-app stores for both the vet and for the client where the client can buy things like medicated shampoos, um, prescription foods, those sorts of things. Um, and the vet can restock their, their pack and their consumables and medications through the vet's on call app. And we also have other revenue streams. So we have a health plan, which is um, your pet's customized flea, tick and worming delivered on the same day every month. So you never forget. So there's multiple ways that Vets On Call makes money. And I think the thing that's very exciting about Vets On Call is it's a very flexible business in that not just the technology that we have and not just the way that we deliver our services, but it means that we're able to add in additional revenue streams as we grow. So in the future, I don't think that it's um, un unfeasible for us to be doing mobile grooming, um, even things like dog walking, those sorts of things and adding in additional pet services um, and products to, to the app and to our service to just make it more easy and convenient for our, for our clients. Awesome. Can you tell me if you have competitors? I think we do have competitors and I'd put them into three kind of um, buckets, I suppose. So we do compete directly with your traditional clinics, your bricks and mortar clinics. We are trying to disrupt the way the industry works. So in terms of them, you've got those guys, they're pretty much the kind of vet that you think of. Um, there is a handful of, of mobile operators within most cities. Um, they're typically sole proprietors or 
potentially partnership operations. Um, and the difference between us and those guys in both instances is one, our scalability. Um, so for a traditional bricks and mortar clinic, the kind of minimum setup cost is, you know, $1.5 million um, mm -hmm. for each clinic. And they've also got a very limited geographic reach. So, you know, you set up a clinic in Brunswick and you're hoping to get clients from Brunswick, Coburg and like the surrounding sort of suburbs or immediately surrounding suburbs. So our geographic reach is larger than that. Um, but then with the, your independent mobile operators, you've got, um, once again, some geographic uh, limitations, but also tech limitations, resource limitations. And the technology that we've created, I refer to as like an, an ecosystem in that we're able to provide for all a pet's needs. So from, from a general consultation right through to surgery, um, knee reconstruction, spinal surgeries, we do all of that. And a typical mobile clinic just simply doesn't have that um, because the technology that we have that backs up all those operations is very sophisticated. And then we have um, what we would classify as like a technology competitor. So that's um, any kind of competitor that is using technology in, in one means or another. It could be telehealth. It could be another sort of booking platform. Um, and I think what really sets us aside from those is the extent of services that we have, but also the vision. And I, I know that sounds very airy-fairy, so I'll add some clarity to that. But we're not, we're not comfortable just being a booking aggregator. So we're not really trying to just set up a vet or connect a vet with a, a um, pet owner and then we're completely hands off we are establishing ourselves as the primary caregiver to our clients because that's really what we what we see as being able to disrupt this industry is establishing ourselves as the primary caregiver and with that that means that a lot more support needs to be given to the vet and to the client but it changes the way that we think about the kind of services that we do the standardization of our services um, and that's something that other tech companies just aren't really looking at it at the moment. So that's what sort of sets us aside, I think. Awesome. So you've got plans to expand to Brisbane, maybe and even Sydney, right? So can you tell, talk us through on the plans? Yeah, so I think it's no surprise, like we've got pretty lofty ambitions in terms of what we want to do. And um, we see any market as any market with a substantial population worthy of us and looking at to enter. Um, and we certainly will be expanding nationwide in the next 18 to 24 months. Brisbane will be the first step and then we'll start looking at Sydney, um, other capital cities and some of the more sort of larger cities like the Gold Coast or Newcastle and how we can enter those markets as well. Awesome. So this is an app or it's on the website? Uh, do you have it on App Store, Google Play? Yep. So we're on the App Store, we're on Google Play. You can also make bookings through our website. Um, and if you're very technology adverse, you can call us. Awesome. So, okay, let's move on to the part, the fact that you're an Indigenous entrepreneur. So there's not many of you. And I was just wondering if you have a, uh, if there's any challenges you face um, as one. Yeah, I think there's, look, I think there's multiple. Um, and, you know, it's not to say that we have more challenges than other entrepreneurs. I think they're just unique challenges. So um, there isn't very many Indigenous entrepreneurs in the tech space, particularly. Um, we're, we're very few and far between. But I think one of the ch challenges in, about being Indigenous um, within this space is what I describe as like the wealth network. Um, and that is when I go to raise capital, typically, you know, you start raising capital from your network. And if you have a very limited network or a, a network that lacks wealth, it can be extremely challenging. And so to give you some, an idea around that, I, um, when I first started Bets on Call, there was another entrepreneur that was working on something different and he raised $1.7 million from friends and family. Now, when I went to my friends and family and I was asking them for $5,000, like they laughed at me, not because they thought that Bets on Call wasn't a good business, but because of the implausibility of them having $5,000 to spare. Um, 12 months later, we were doing more in a single day than that other entrepreneur was doing in a month. 
but they were still able to raise capital from venture capitalists because they had warm introductions to those guys. Um, and that's really where that starts to get very challenging because as a tip general rule, um, a venture capitalist doesn't want to talk to you if it's a cold call. They want to have a warm entry from somebody that they know that says, hey, you should talk to this guy. He's doing something great. I'm going to make the introduction. And that's where you start to get the wheels turning. We didn't have that. And I think that is an incredibly difficult thing for Indigenous entrepreneurs to grapple with because, um, you know, we were uh, not our generation, but like my dad's generation, as an example, was kept out of the of building wealth, really, um, through legislative and other sorts of social um, constraints. And so like building wealth and trying to navigate that whole path is very new to Indigenous people. So I think that's that's one very big challenge. I think also something that I've come across, and it's not just as as a business person, it's happened you know many times throughout my life, is the low expectations for for Indigenous Australians. So when you're talking about business and stuff like that, there's this, I think, an unconscious bias to how would I say this, to downplay like what they think you can achieve. Mm -hmm. So even if you're doing really well, you know, there's this still sort of like hesitancy. Well, is he really going to do it? You know, he's an Indigenous entrepreneur. He doesn't have any um, business experience. He's never built anything like this before. But, you know, if you would, if I wasn't Indigenous, would that still come up? Um, a great example of this was I was asked recently by a, a venture capitalist um, after I had, we'd secured a very high profile um, venture firm that was investing in bets on call. And I was talking to this other venture firm about it and saying, you know, there's still room in the round, like you can jump in if you need, if you would like to. And they said, but how much weighting did they, those guys give to you because you're Indigenous? And I, I said, well, what do you mean? Well, they're investing, but, you know, how much weighting in terms of their decision to invest in you was based on whether you're Indigenous or not? And I said, none. But the, but the implication was that they thought because I was Indigenous, someone was giving me a handout mm. rather, than be, rather than investing on the merit of the business. And in terms of the merit of the business, like what we've done in the short time we've been operating is pretty, pretty outstanding. Um, and I think that the business and the performance of the business speaks for itself. And that's certainly what the investor that um, invested said. But that that attitude of like, well, is he getting this because he's Indigenous or is he getting this because he's actually doing well? Um, I think that's just something that as an Indigenous entrepreneur, you have to grapple with on a day-to-day -day basis. And Another example is whenever I've had media, I've had people tell me that I'm, I'm only getting the media because I'm Indigenous, not because of what we're doing is unique and, and disruptive um, or that we're doing really well at it. It's because I'm Indigenous. And that's just something that I think we have to grapple with in, in changing those kinds of perceptions of Indigenous people. Awesome. Um, what about, um, do you give pro bono advice to other um, Indigenous entrepreneurs? Are you like, or how do you how do you propose you advise other people who want to start a business but uh, indigenous but they have no clue like what to do where to go? Yeah, well, I was like that once. <laughs> <laughs> so um, look, I think I don't do anything formally, um, and that's more so not because I don't have the desire to do it. It's purely because uh, vets on call is very time demanding, and I think I would be doing a disservice to anyone that I would set up a formal arrangement with. But I do make myself available for informal chats. If I have a, an entrepreneur reach out to me that says, hey, this is what I would like to do. This is what I'm thinking. Um, do you have 20 minutes for me to get some advice? I'm always open to do that. I will always make myself available. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that really drives me as a business person is that we, the, success, the success that we're getting at Vets on Call is going to be an example to the next generation of Indigenous kids as to what they can achieve. And that business is certainly um, a very, like a real possibility for them to succeed. Because I think that when I was, when I was growing up um, in the 90s, that 
the only Indigenous people you saw succeeding were all sports people. So when you start thinking about your career pathways and how you're going to change your life for the better, you know, it's very difficult to think outside of that. And if you're not going to be a sports person, um, which unfortunately I never was, uh, you know, it makes it, it's very difficult to think of, okay, well, where else could I succeed? So one of the things that, um, you know, really does motivate me is to be seen to succeed for the next generation of Indigenous kids so that when they're plotting their pathways, they look at business and go, well, he did it. It's surely something that I can do as well. So, you know, I think that that's part of, like, like I said, that's one of the things that makes me get up every morning, but it's also pretty ingrained into me that, you know, it's my responsibility to give back where I can. So I've had some pretty amazing opportunities and, and had some people help me, a lot of people help me along the ways with advice or with help in business. And, you know, I do see that as a responsibility to, to pass that forward. Awesome. So that's all we have the time for today. We'd like to wish you all the best for your expansion to Brisbane and Sydney. And uh, yeah, we well, can't wait to see you in Sydney, especially. <laughs> I'll let you know when we're there. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for your time today.